and permission of all of you and all you wonderful people and all the fantastic, phenomenal staff of CBC. When is the only time you hear Jesus' name in a Unitarian church? When the janitor slips on the ladder. <laughs> We're going to be dealing with such a somber subject, I have to get that little humor <laughs> out of the way. And I wish to request that you listen very, very quickly uh, because I have a very fixed time limit and I'm not sure how to get it all in, but I'm gonna squeeze it in. But the one thing I'm not going to do is cross Pastor Brogy, which is a kind of funny expression for a uh, not yet completed Jew to say <laughs> in a uh, church social hall. But on to our subject. Anti-Semitism is a single term for many different attitudes, covering everything from telling crude jokes about Jews to desiring to murder them. There's a Jewish proverb that anti-Semite is a person who hates Jews more than is absolutely necessary. Post-biblically, the intense hostility towards Jews begins with the rise of Christianity. Initially, this hatred was consequential to the Jewish rejection of the new re relationship offered to God. And then exacerbated, Jews were accused of being Christ killers. And ju ju just for the record, it was the Romans and not the Jews who killed Jesus. But once this accusation had been launched, then any crime, no matter how horrific or bizarre or anti-human, was believable. Among the results were blood libels. Blood libel is outrageous accusation that Jews required for a spiritual right to murder a Christian child and then drink his blood. The cruel irony is that the blood libel was directed against the first nation in history to outlaw human sacrifice. And the only people in the ancient Near East which forbade the consumption of any blood. As it says in the Torah over, it says in the Torah five different times that blood is forbidden. In other words, it is more forbidden for me to taste blood than it is for me to eat pork. And because of these blood libels, tens of thousands of innocent Jews were murdered en masse, and the confiscation of Jewish property always followed. Here is a brief summary. In the earliest days of Christianity, St. John Chrysostom, frustrated by the Jews' refusal to convert, called them the most miserable of men. The great theologian Martin Luther, encountering the same steadfastness, declared, their synagogue should be set on fire, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Let us drive them out of the country for all time. In every country, the Jews were the convenient enemy. To the illiterate, they were knowledgeable. To the peasants, wealthy. To the rich, clever. The Romans saw them as political rivals. The inquisitors saw them as Christ killers. The Cossacks saw them as squeezing out the wealth of the land. To them, he was different. Different in his looks, in his mode of dress, in his beliefs, in the observance of his holy day. One law followed after another, barring Jews from reversing forced baptisms. By the way, a Bulgarian proverb is, when you baptize a Jew, hold his head under the water for five minutes. From building synagogues, and then occupational residential ghettoization. Jews were confined to doing only very despicable employment, like, lend, like lending money, and living in neighborhoods that were never desirous. But by the mid-19th century, anti-Semitism no longer focused on what the Jews believed or how they behaved, but on what they must actually be. Hatred metastasizes much more than it ferments. It was explained that race like the breed of a dog is a characteristic which goes from generation to generation. 
The Germans, like their German shepherds, are good at fighters. The French, like their poodles, are showy. The British, like their bulldogs, are tenacious. And Jews never reach the level of canine. They're more associated with rodents. And this would become a, seri a very serious uh, Nazi cinematic staple. This is a pretty famous anti-Semitic Nazi film of how the stereotypical religious Jew morphs into a rat, the eternal Jew. For the record, I'm blessed with 18 children and only several of them do not li even like cheese. <laughs> so it's not to contaminate the superior race, eugenicists or racial hygiene, mandated that the only way to eliminate Jewish characteristics, no different than the Nazi need to kill deformed or handicapped children, was to have them removed, which could be justified as a form of racial hygiene. The latest scourge of anti-Semitism plaguing America is African-American anti-Semitism based on the usual absurd and dishonest accusations. So in the modern day, 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, things are not getting better. Yesterday's bigots never heard of the internet, but in 2020, the social media provides an unmatched tool for rebottling old hatreds in new bottles. Now we move from the cause to the effect. Everyone has on their seats a timeline. You may wish to consult this as we go along to help line things up. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi ideologues, subsequently the entire German people, and there were just about a handful of protesters, according to my daughter's sophisticated high school calculator, I put in a handful divided by 90 million, and several times it could not compute it, only came up with zero. The Jewish people, or as they refer to as the race, were a menace to Aryan master race. Therefore, they had to be humiliated, tortured, and eliminated. Jews were referred to as bacilli vermin. Bacilli vermin are parasites that suck the blood and destroy the host. If you refer to them as humans, then what you're about to do is murder. If you refer to them as bacilli vermin, then what you're doing is self-preservation. What do you do with parasites? You exterminate. And that's self-preservation. For the German mind could not fathom how the invincible German army, which had not lost a battle from the time that Bismarck had united the country, how could it be that they could have lost World War I? And they never referred to it as a loss. They called it Sonnenbruch, which means a collapse. There's an enemy from within which pulled out the carpet, and Germany collapsed. That enemy from within had committed a Dolstus a stab in the back. It's preservation to eliminate them lest they do this again. Nazi propaganda, which was very carefully honed by the master, Josef Goebbels, a very close aide of Hitler, and the minister of propaganda, this sounds bizarre in English, not so peculiar in German, he was able to convince an entire country that a tad more than half a percent of the population had all the food, commerce, industry, and competition. Arithmetically, this is impossible. And not only is it impossible, but it's not grounded in any fact. So Goebbels taught the doctrine, tell a lie a thousand times, and it becomes the truth. But if it's not grounded in fact, he also used a technique which Hitler had honed, called the great lie, or the big lie. If I tell you something which isn't true, you're not going to believe me. But if I say something which is so preposterous, you think, he can't make that up. It's got to be true. And so you have a whole population believing this is the problem. And the idea of a master race to a people that have been suffering, that are hungry, tens of millions are out of work. It is ennobling to think that they are, in fact, a master race. Now, a master race means elimination of not only Jews,
but those that are mentally ill, physically handicapped, deformed, those that Hitler deemed were unworthy of life, a drain on the German economy. Creation is not yet at an end. Man is becoming God. Man is God in the making. Note how the superiority of the Aryan it was always at the expense of the inferiority of the Jew. I'm going to go back to this, this clip for just a second. Here you have two Jewish students forced to stand at the front of the room, humiliated by their classmates. Look at their beaks as they're taught racial science. On the right is the Jew, clearly not suffering from hunger, despicable, Arafat whiskers. On the left is the Aryan with the washboard stomach, like the bottom of a turtle, productive, holding a shovel. And this is a reader in Germany. We all remember readers, see, spot, run, Dick and Jane. So here you have this despicable looking Jew, abhorrent, holding a cone of candy, seducing these beautiful looking Aryan children looking like Norman Rockwell kids. The next page, which we don't have here, is the Jew fornicating with the children. Everything is emotional. Now, those that Hitler deemed unworthy of life, those that are mentally unstable, physically unstable, or just have illness, by August of 1941, 70,000 Germans have been murdered. The handicapped, emotionally unstable, this presented log uh, logistic difficulties. How do you do this secretly? These murderers, later to be known as the Euthanasia Department, purely George Orwell's terms were inspired by the Nazis, they improvised the idea of a gas van. This enabled them to bring the gas chamber to the victim. But how do you get rid of the bodies? So you cram them, you bring the gas van to the victim, cram them inside, and then you can dispose of their corpses in a near, in a near forest. It says on the sign, Kaiser's Coffee Geschäft, the Kaiser's Coffee Company. I can't imagine that anyone would want to get rid of their demented grandparents, or their child with Downs, or their sister who is blind. So where is the protest? It wasn't. The only answer I have is what Protestant pastor Martin Muller said, they came for the Jews and I did not protest for I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists and I did not object for I was not a communist. Then they came for the industrialists and I did not object for I was not an industrialist. When they came for me, there was no one left to protest. And Pastor Neumoller spent the rest of the war in a concentration camp. September 15, 1935, the law for the protection of German blood and honor, better known as Nuremberg Laws, were intended to identify and isolate the Jew. One Jewish grandparent would then defile all the subsequent Michelin tainted and stained with Jewish blood. We'll see in the future what this means. The next step is to attack and expropriate them and eliminate their livelihoods so they cannot provide for themselves. The Nuremberg Laws had a crippling effect on the Jewish community. No one was no longer permitted to socialize with Jews. They stopped soliciting Jewish stores. By 1938, it's forbidden for Jews to be employed, and any enterprise owned by a Jew had to go out of business. By 1938, there are three major events because Hitler is about to begin a world war. Beginning with March of 1938 is the Anschluss. Hitler believed every country, a country which has the same language as Germany should have the same flag. 
So there's a referendum in Austria known as the Anschluss. 99.7%, what happened to the 180,000 Jews? Forgot to vote. Very democratic elections. Vote they want to be under Nazi dominion. For three days, they danced in the streets until they realized, uh, yeah, 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 what it's like to be under a dictatorship. Then, in the fall of 1938, is the Munich Conference. I shan't even ask you where it took place, where Britain and France capitulate and give away a large swath of Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, to the Nazis. And then Hitler begins to panic. He's not yet fired a shot, and he's afraid that his people are becoming soft because he has to prepare them for the eventualities of war. But there's going to be all kinds of difficulties, even on the home front. There's going to be scarcities. There's going to be body bags coming back by the truckload. How do I prepare them? Always the same answer, to pick on the Jews. So on October 27th, 1938, in the middle of the night, between 2 o'clock and 4.30 in the morning, all Jews of Polish ancestry, their doors are banged down, and they're driven out of their homes and placed in trucks and in trains in the driving rain to go to the Polish border. And then when they arrive at the border, they are forced in the pouring rain to run four kilometers as they are whipped over the country. Sir Martin Gilbert writes that the road out of Germany was red with Jewish blood. Now, even if you're a runner, in the middle of the night, in the driving rain, and if you're elderly, crippled, sick, or young, four kilometers you have to run as you're whipped by the Gestapo and beaten. Whoever stumbles or trips or suffers a heart attack is stampeded by all those other over 17,000 running away from the whipping of the Gestapo. Now the Poles will not let them in. The Germans have evicted them, and they're now in no man's land. And here they are without a roof over their head at the beginning of the Polish winter with no food, no shelter. The only place they can stay are pigsties with the excrement still present and horse stables with the dung still present. One person who was banished, his name was Zundel Greenspan, a tailor. His son Herschel was studying in a university in Paris. When Herschel reads in the newspaper about the plight of the Jews, and then he gets a postcard from his sister describing how appalling the conditions are. He's indeed appalled. In an act of desperation, he gets hold of a pistol and enters the German embassy in Paris. He shoots the first German he sees, a thoroughly unimportant individual, shooting him November 7, 1938. His chance of recovery was excellent. But Goebbels realized there's much more hay to be made if he dies as a martyr. The Germans see to it that he's denied any medical care, and two days later he succumbs to his wounds. And now there is the canard. A Jew has killed a German. That will be the catalytic enzyme for Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Every synagogue is put to the torch. Hundreds of synagogues were sacked, pillaged, or burnt. The firemen were ordered to let them burn. Every Jewish enterprise is ransacked, pillaged, and plundered. The night of broken glass means all glass in Germany, like all of Europe, comes from Belgium. More than seven times the yearly import of glass was destroyed. Jews, in the middle of the night, cold winter night, are forced to run across in their night clothes across the shards of glass. They have to sing outside and dance outside the synagogues as they're burnt, or they are forced to ignite them. And they have to pay an atonement tax of one billion Reichmarks for the damage that was caused. Then they have to clean up the incredible wreckage. The image to the right is a synagogue which is gutted. To the left, you see them cleaning up their shops. They have to repair their shops and have to, cannot collect a quarter million Reichmarks in insurance payments. Once they repair them, they are expropriated or aryanized. In the center is a village where all the holy items of a synagogue are put to the torch as the village looks on cheering. 
This tax of one billion Reichmarks brings German Jewry to suffocating poverty. Now, there are also, Jews are dragged from work, as you see them, even with their ties, forced to clean up the wreckage as countless bystanders look on, cheer, and jeer. Now, these scenes of Kristallnacht are seen across the world because it's nearly a year before the war begins. They see them in America. They see them in the West. Children hauled out of schools as they were spit upon, spat upon by their classmates, stoned together with their teachers. 30,000 Jews are arrested that night and suffered exquisite torture, standing on their feet as they are whipped, not allowed to relieve themselves. And then in the morning, the Orthodox Jews are forced to clean up the excrement and the urine with their beards as they're driven, as everyone is jeering them, off to the concentration camps. This is Buchenwald, 1938. Buchenwald is a concentration camp. It looks like 1944. This is nearly a year before the war begins, Jews in Germany. If any Jew wishes to escape, to leave, if there was a country on earth willing to take them, and there are hardly any, certainly at this point, later there'll be none, they have to remit over 90% of their possessions to the German government. That means they'll have to leave the country to a foreign land where they don't speak the language, don't know the culture, as paupers, without a penny. This confiscatory tax generated nearly one billion Reichmarks for the German government. This billion plus the atonement tax of Kristallnacht resulted in the greatest financial wherewithal for the Third Reich. The Jews in Germany were extraordinarily assimilated, intermarried, reform, non-observant, and they were so assimilated you could barely tell if you could tell at all who was Jewish. But once World War II begins and German soldiers enter Poland, mm -hmm. guys, a little glitch. Uh, once they enter Poland, you have now one and a half million soldiers, German soldiers. After they invade Poland, there are many of what so right away, the German soldiers have a heyday like never before. They have never seen Jews that look so stereotypically Jewish. And the soldiers right away are busy committing atrocities to the religious looking Jews. But this is not an efficient way to run an army. Soldiers need to attack. So they devise having an SS that will deal with the Jews and they will sequestrate them into ghettos so that will leave the soldiers to fight the battles. Speaking now is Professor Christopher Browning, recognized as one of the most important historians, contemporary historians, regarding the Holocaust. After they invade Poland, there are many of what I would call rituals of humiliation or rituals of violence, in which they will grab Jews off the street and cut their beards that no one attempts to stop. I mean, it's, it's uh, if anything, some people are encouraging them. From the moment they arrived in Poland, the task of the German troops was to terrorize the Jewish population. The campaign of hate and violence would force the Jews to flee the areas that were to be part of the Reich and drive them into the Soviet-occupied zone. In just a few days, Wehrmacht and Einsatzgruppen units would murder 600 Jews. Orthodox Jews were the prime targets. In addition to their favorite entertainment, the beard game, where they would cut, burn, or pull out Jews' beards, often tearing chunks out of their cheeks. The Nazis enjoyed making these Orthodox Jews jump, dance, and sing at the bonfires on which their sacred books were being burned. They whipped them, forced them to eat pork, and carved stars of David on their foreheads. The final solution of the Jewish question, as the Nazis referred to it, meant the Nazi plan to murder every single Jew on the planet but it evolved in stages. Citizenship was denied. They were stripped of their assets, sources of livelihood, forbidden freedom of movement and all communication, and then all were marked with yellow badges or armbands. I presume that the picture, whoops, I presume 
that the picture on the right is a propaganda picture. People wearing badges like this are not smiling. And the proof is the next picture, which is really most remarkable. You have a bride and groom on their wedding day, and I believe the bride is co trying, attempting to cover the Jewish star with her bouquet. To better monitor and isolate the danger of the Jew, they were herded into tiny, disease-ridden, sealed ghettos without sanitation, food, or the possibility of warming themselves. Now, the preparation to send the Jews off to the ghettos were done in secret. The movement was to be done sudden and precisely shlagartic, and that secrecy was necessary to assure the hurried abandonment of much movable Jewish property, which could then be conveniently confiscated. See them taking their small, meager possessions as they're walking barefoot, thinking they're going to be resettled as they're sent from all across the countryside into ghettos. An aggressive diet for a woman, not exactly my expertise, is about 1,500 calories a day. If you were to consume 1,500 calories a day, you'd lose an enormous amount of weight. I'm able to burn 400 calories running in half an hour. That's a pretty fast clip. I'm not telling you what I could do in an hour because I can't maintain the same, same pace. But let's make it arithmetically very simple. Let's say 800 calories an hour, and to be eligible for a ration card in the ghetto, you have to work in excess of 12 hours a day. It could easily be 14 hours, 16 hours, 19 hours. But to make this arithmetically simple, 800 calories times 15 hours a day means you're burning 12,000 calories. To be eligible for a ration card, you had to work burning these 12,000 calories, and the ration card was for you, your spouse, and two children. But what if you have three children, or four children, or in my instance, 18 children, an elderly grandmother, and a brother, and an uncle? All of these mouths have to eat from this one ration card. One more time, you're burning 12,000 calories, and the ration card is for 183 calories to go for everyone. That's guaranteed starvation. Hunger not only affected the belly, it injured the mind. Hunger killed, but it also brought about disabling change. Mental, psychological, physical. Loss of weight and the disappearance of subcutaneous fat, which made it too painful to sit down, to lie, to walk. Before you weighed 142 pounds, now you weigh 53 pounds. You're a bag of bones. The ghetto inhabitants were dying of hunger, and totally consumed with craving for food. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, this is the daily suffering of the hungry. And there's disease everywhere. And you have in a tight apartment where everyone is forced to live together, no way to stop typhus spreading, tuberculosis spreading, there's no medication to present it. Roughly 83,000 in the Warsaw Ghetto died just from starvation and disease which is before they're sent to the extermination camps. There's epidemics of countless diseases, but everyone in the ghettos is suffering from dysentery, bacillary dysentery, horrible diarrhea. In the Ludge ghetto, Ludge is a very large city in Poland. There were 200,000 Jews in Ludge prior to the war. In Ludge, only 3% of the toilets in the ghetto work. Let's say you're one of the fortunate ones and you live in a building which has a working toilet. You get up in the morning, it's 47 and crammed to a room, you have horrific diarrhea, and you're 47th online to get to the toilet. How do you feel? And when your turn finally comes, it's not like someone has cleaned up, and before you even get to the bowl, they're banging on the door for you to get out for the next person to get in. This will highlight just a little bit of the squalor of the ghetto. This was taken by a German soldier when he visited, noticed the matchstick legs. 
The Jews of the ghetto are subject to disease, humiliation, savage brutality, and forced labor without remuneration. At its peak, 80% of the food in the ghetto is smuggled. The smugglers are the children. That's what they were called. These kids would risk their lives climbing over the walls of the ghetto or under the fences to somehow barter or steal or collect a scrap of carrot peel, a piece of potato, and then they would, after risking their lives, would climb back into the ghetto. And what would they do with this food? Give it to an elderly man. Give it to a pregnant woman, even though they risked their lives to collect it. In the Warsaw Ghetto, where it is so dense, half a million people at its height are all fighting for one scrap of food. There's only one institution to a small degree comparable to the ghetto. And even that comparison is inadequate. And that is the jail. For people who go to jail understand that they are there for having violated society's norms. But when you're incarcerated in the ghetto, it's for no crime whatsoever other than the crime of being, of being a Jew. There are, where is, sorry. There are beggars that line the streets. They are ubiquitous and commonplace. Their doleful songs and plaintive laments fill the air. There is no such thing as privacy in the ghetto. If a girl wishes to, rele to remove her blouse, it's done in public. If you have to relieve yourself, there is no privacy. One girl in the Warsaw Ghetto wrote, my ears are filled with the deafening clamor of crowded streets and cries of people dying on the sidewalks. Even the quiet hours of the night are filled with the snoring and coughing of those who share the same apartment or only too often with the shots and screams coming from the streets. The food which comes into the ghetto, if it's not by the smugglers, which accounted for 80% of the food, had to be paid for by the Jews through the Judenrat, the Council of Elders. Now, the Germans believed, like all anti-Semites, that the Jews have so much money. They came into Poland, and the thing which drove Polish Jewry was grinding poverty. The average Polish Jew never even tasted milk. All they had was a cup of water where they pour in a few drops of milk to make it cloudy. A girl had one dress, weekday in the Sabbath. She got taller, a hem. Taller, another hem. And yet another hem, and another hem. And you could almost tell her age that you could count the rings of a tree. You had one pair of shoes, weekday Sabbath. The toe came out a patch, the heel broke a patch, the sole broke a patch, bulbous appendages, those were the shoes. And the Germans were so disappointed, where was the loot? Of course, when any money the Jews had was confiscated. So what they found from Polish Jewry was not the money they had hoped for, and they made constant, dynamic, perpetual demands on the Judenrat and making the Jews do their dirty work for them. And they would say, if you don't have this money by 5 o'clock at night, you'll be tortured and beaten, which they would do. But what the Jews of Poland provided for the Germans was not the money they had hoped for, but endless possibilities of torture and a labor force that was three million strong of skilled laborers. When Jews were forced into the ghetto, at the last moments they tried to entrust their possessions, jewelry, furniture to their Christian neighbors. And then when the effects of starvation were so acute, they would risk their lives take off their stars, because going outside the ghetto for a Jew meant instant death, and go back to their neighbors to try and get the money, their possessions back so they could use this money to barter and get some food. They often learned to their dismay that their Christian acquaintances would not return their property. The overcrowding meant a breakdown of sanitation, toilets, and there is cold, which is minus 30 degrees, and the worst I get over 100,000 are naked the body cannot cope with these temperatures. There is a stench because 3% of the toilets work. Everyone else is outside living in the sewer. We're de decomposing bodies and animals.
every single Jew under Nazi dominion was oppressed, terrorized, ultimately removed to either the killing sites or extermination camps. Throughout all this process, there was no protest from the citizens in the free world, from the Nazi-dominated world, from the church, or the governments, with the exception of King Christian X in Denmark, the small Jewish community of Denmark was saved, and in Bulgaria proper, the Jews were saved, but in the territories Thrace and Macedonia, Jews were sent to their death. June 22nd, 1941 is a watershed date in World War II. On this date, Nazi Germany invades its arch ally, the Soviet Union. Stalin is totally unprepared for this. He suffers a nervous breakdown. And there are no Russian generals to defend against the Germans because Stalin was always suspicious of his generals and he always had them assassinated. Stalin had to go to the Gulag concentration camps and pull out officers to man the Russian army. In the end, which Russian general was able to repel the Germans? As you all recall, General Frost, the Russian winter. They roll into Russia like a, with a blitzkrieg, and they are on the lips of Moscow, 30 kilometers away. They get as far as Stalingrad, and then the Russian winter kicks in. Oil freezing the tanks, and they cannot advance. The Russians are more adept than the Germans in fighting in the cold. And this begins the final solution. Directly behind the frontline troops is the Einsatz group, and the special death units, four different groups. This is not the riffraff of German society. It is scientists, architects, industrialists, school superintendents, each one headed by a doctorate in philosophy, no less. And they take the Jews, they bring them out to the fields and force them to dig, to dig trenches, anti-tank trenches, large pits. Then they have to fold their clothing and tie their shoes together. This is shot by a soldier passing by as they are driven to the pits where they're going to be shot. The death is always done by running to the pits. All death in Germany, these masters of murder, is done by running. Even when they arrive at the extermination camps, they have to run to the gas chambers. Why running? For these experts understood that when you run, it's harder to concentrate. I'm going to just divert for a second to something a little bit lighter. Thanks to Rich Brogy, that's Pastor Brogy's brother. He sponsored my two sons and myself to run in the Marine Corps Marathon last year. And the Marine Corps Marathon was the day after the Pittsburgh Massacre, where 11 Jews were shot in the synagogue to death. Six were seriously wounded. And when you run, I don't know the exact terminology, but there's the VO2 level, or the physiological ceiling, lactate threshold. You get to a level in running where you cannot speak. And I'm running in the race, and I'm visibly pretty obviously Jewish, and I just want to highlight what a great country America is, as if you don't know this. But as I'm running, those when you're running, it's you against the clock, and you're, you can't speak. People slowed down, because I'm slow, slowed down and said, sorry about your brothers, and then took off. The method of mass murder, of taking out 30,000 every single day and shooting them in the fields, creased, created logistic problems for the Germans. Because what about good old German efficiency of using the hair for insulation and jackets? using the skin for lampshades, using the gold in the teeth for gold, and the mountains of prosthetic limbs and spectacles and all kinds of articles, and using the body for compost and fertilizer. You shoot them in the fields, you eliminated a Jew, but you're not getting good mileage, you're not harvesting from the body. Plus, it proved to be difficult upon the soldiers. Shooting every single day, men, women and children, the elderly and the very young. Now, it didn't stop them, but if you closed your eyes, the children sounded like German children. It's hard to shoot all these babies that are crying. So they need to have a better system because it was difficult for the soldiers. So what they did was, and I made up this word, they lubricated them, gave them scotch and vodka. But it's not an efficient way to run an army if everyone is inebriated. 
And it costs a lot of manpower to cordon off the area. And it's a waste of bullets. And it's detrimental for the troops. So the Einsatzgruppen are still trying, doing everything possible to terrorize the people. One German practice to terrorize the population was to carry out public hangings. There would be a public execution, and usually they would force people to watch. Today, the Gestapo have announced that tomorrow at 11 a.m. they will hang Jews. We don't know who these Jews are, nor for what reason they will be hanged. As they were taken to the scaffold, the poor souls raised their eyes to heaven and murmured something. The hangman grabbed them and put the rope around their necks. For a moment, they struggled and kicked, then nothing. Afterwards, the assassins took out flasks of liquor from their pockets, shook hands, shouting, Morgan Weiter, we'll carry on tomorrow. The victims were left hanging until four in the afternoon. Then they were cut down and taken to the cemetery. Because of these drawbacks, the SS authorities were looking for ways that were more efficient, quicker, and less effort. They would always employ verbal camouflage and deceit to conceal what lay in store, always employing Orwellian terms, calling the extermination centers the East. Gas, killing murder by gas was called Sonderbehandlung, special treatment. Because the Germans were so effective and misleading, escape was rarely attempted. For in order to escape, you need to have some kind of base in the local population. The Jews knew that the Poles would not give them any haven. They would either give them back to the Germans or murder them themselves. Likewise, the Ukrainians. And as the Jews now are being sent in extermination camps to what they are told are showers, which are, of course, gas chambers, it was thoroughly unimaginable to these starving, tortured souls that had subsisted in the squalor of the ghettos, where epidemics claimed thousands of lives, and the victims were murdered all the time for the slightest infraction. One Jew escapes from the ghetto to join the partisans. Easily a thousand could be lined up and mowed down. So when they see this, and they're told they're going to be resettled, and sent to work in the harvest, the mind thinks, what could be better? The Nile is not just a river in Egypt. You're told, let's look at these faces. These are people being sent to their death in the trains and trucks that will take them to the extermination camps. Look at their faces. What I see on them is relief. You just cannot imagine anything could be worse than the ghetto. To give you a more personal example, I consider myself of at least perhaps above average intelligence. I lost the sun, and I'm in the hospital, and I see the monitor go flat. And I thought there must have been a power outage. Now, the lights were on. I heard blips and swishes and noises, but that's the way the mind worked. The Nile is not just a river in Egypt. And since they were allowed to go to the trains, where they're told they're going to be resettled with their few meager possessions, they were confident they were not being sent to their death. To maintain the deception, the Germans arranged, at least in the Warsaw Ghetto, for they knew there were Jews still hiding, for Jews about to go into the gas chamber at rifle point to send home postcards describing, extolling how wonderful the schools are, how yummy the food is, and how wonderful it is to be reunited with family. Signed, Grandma. And you get a letter from your grandmother telling you, in a familiar handwriting, how wonderful things are, and it's postmarked from the most idyllic locations in Europe. You want to believe, as Freud writes, that which is best. You can't believe that which is worst. Everything is deception. Even the sign, into Auschwitz, is a deception. Arbeit macht frei. Work liberates. Work makes you free. They think they're being sent to a work camp when actually an extermination center. When they arrive in the camps, there's a guard, and there's very bucolic music which is playing. A guard will be standing on a ramp, and he says, my friends, welcome to this camp. You're going to love it here. We can't wait to give you a warm meal, but please, before we do this, we can't afford to have disease here. Please be so kind to take off your clothing so we can have it sanitized. 
Could anything make a person feel more secure than having their clothing sanitized? When he finished his little speech, the Jews would applaud. Four minutes later, they were dead or on their way to death. The clothing came off, then came out the whips, the truncheons, the pitchforks, driving them into what was called Himmelstrasse, the road to heaven, the one way into the gas chamber. And now what can you expect from these starving sick people who saw the rabbis humiliated and burned alive, they lost all of their family, yelled at by SS troops, German shepherds, restrained, about to bite off their genitals, clobbered by spiked truncheons, and then the final deception, gas chambers designed as showers. The very monstrosity of the crime made it in the word impossible to believe. The last words they heard, if they heard it, was Ivan, turn on the water. And there's a deception of language, even of music. Plans went ahead with the establishment of a massive concentration camp complex at Auschwitz-Birkenau, to which Jews from all over Europe would be sent. At Treblinka, the commandant had a facade of a railway station erected to deceive the victims. At Auschwitz, arrivals were greeted by an orchestra. A completely new use of the German language was devised to create a sense of security. Deportation had become resettlement. Selection for death had become special treatment. Gas chambers had become showers. The perfection of the art of genocide was mastered in Auschwitz. If you were a communist, homosexual, a political prisoner, with luck you could survive. But as the commandant of Auschwitz said, for a Jew, the only way out was up through the chimney of the gas chamber. I'm going to read you a short selection from a prisoner in Treblinka, one of the extermination camps, and he writes, I shall tell the story of one day, an ordinary day, much like any other. The day I worked on cleaning a shed, an umbrella had gotten stuck in a roof beam, and the SS man Paul Groth ordered a boy to get it down. The boy climbed up, fell from the roof, and was injured. Groth punished him with 25 lashes. Groth was pleased with what had happened and called over another German and told him that he had found parachutists among the Jews. We were ordered to climb up to the roof one after another. The majority did not succeed. They fell down, broke their legs, were whipped, and then bitten by Barry, the dog, the dog the size of a mule, that would maul them. This game also was not enough for Groth. There were many mice around, and each of us was ordered to catch two mice. He selected five prisoners, ordered them to pull down their trousers, and drop the mice inside. The people were ordered to remain at attention, but they could not without moving. They were whipped. But this also was not enough for Groth. He called over a Jew, forced him to drink alcohol until he fell dead. We were ordered to lay him, the man on a board, pick him up, and slowly march while singing a funeral march. This is a description of an ordinary day, and many, many were far, far worse. Certainly no later than the fall of 1942, as you'll, if you're looking along in your cards, the American government was aware of the extermination process. The President of the United States, named after the highway in Manhattan, and the outrageously anti-Semitic State Department did not publicize the information and refused to offer assistance. The State Department worked overtime to see to it that Jewish refugees that had already acquired the paperwork and paid the fees to come to America were denied entrance. We're talking about the known compliance in terms of tens of thousands of deaths. There was a deliberate decision made by America and England and other allied countries not to bomb Auschwitz or the rail lines leading up to it, even though the allies controlled the skies certainly by 1944. There are many flights that went over Auschwitz with very significant payloads of bombs. They could have easily dropped bombs on Auschwitz. I heard an interview with the pilots and they said if we had been told to bomb, our accuracy would have been on the rail lines 
85%. 85% accuracy in wartime is very significant. To destroy a rail line were the murder operations working around the clock. In the summer of 1944, 350,000 Hungarian Jews are incinerated in Auschwitz. If you destroy a rail line, it takes a week to repair it. That would have really disrupted the murder process. But despite the FDR and the State Department's collusion, I should not fail to mention how America committed enormous resources of manpower, somewhere between 2.5 million and 4 million soldiers, including both of my parents, my mother was a much more senior officer in the American army than my father, to fighting the Germans. And it was only the American military presence made possible the defeat and the collapse of the Nazi dictatorship. That brings us to the liberation. A column of tanks rolling past the entrance. They were brown, with white stars painted on their sides. The Americans! He screamed madly. The Americans! Soon, everyone in the camp was screaming. We are free! We are free! But free to go where? They had no family members left alive. Their homes were taken over. If they returned to their anti-Semitic towns and villages, there would have been pogroms, and they would have, after going through all this, would have been murdered. The logical place for everyone to travel would have been to Israel or Palestine, but it was controlled by the Escobar White Paper, which forbade Jewish immigration. America had closed its doors before the war, during the war, and after the war, as did Canada, South Africa, Australia, and every other country. Where were they to go? So they remained where they were, and the concentration camps became DP camps. When America liberated the first of the concentration camps, soldiers could not believe their eyes. They summoned the Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower. When he arrived at the camp, he saw endless and terminal stacks of bodies and heads shot in the skull, and the crematoria still steaming, the stench which was overpowering. He was accompanied by General Patton, whose nickname was Old Blood and Guts, went behind one of the buildings and threw up the rest of the afternoon. There was an American soldier, out of sheer nervousness, began to giggle, and Eisenhower fixed him with a stare which could have frozen lava. And he said to him, they say that the American soldier doesn't know what he's fighting for, and he ordered as many troops as possible to come and see this camp that were not on the front line. He said, they don't know what they're fighting for. Let us come and see at least what they're fighting against. So how do we tell the story of the mass murdered and how do we comprehend that the millions were composed of millions of individuals? There's a school in rural Tennessee where they collected six million paper clips, paper clips, because it's easier to envision paper clips over six million souls that were murdered. It's easier to think about Anne Frank than six million murdered lives. It's hard to focus and imagine upon the mountain ranges of shoes, spectacles, prosthetic limbs, once belonged to boys and girls, scientists and tinsmiths, rabbis and seamstresses. Earlier in January, the Soviets came upon another death camp, Treblinka. One of those brought to the site was Dr. Adolf Berman, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. There, Berman saw thousands of shoes of every description. Later, the poet Moshe Shulstein, also a survivor, would write about the shoes of Treblinka. I have seen a mountain, he wrote, higher than Mont Blanc and holier than Sinai. Such a mountain I saw of Jewish shoes in Treblinka. Suddenly, that mountain of shoes stands up in pairs, in rows, big shoes and little shoes, from Warsaw and Paris, from Amsterdam and Prague. Shoes rabbis wore, traders and workers, all sorts of shoes, and the knitted booties of a little child, just like its parents, it was killed. We 
were brought to Treblinka, marching heel and soul. And now, we are marching to get away from the killing that went on night and day. Let the world hear us come down the road. Let the world listen to our tale of blood. We shall not let you rest again. My challenge as a docent in Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial for the martyrs of the Holocaust, is to tell the individual story. When Jews survived the Holocaust, understandably, they were very anxious to tell the story and how they survived and how they had been betrayed. But those who could not tell the story then, and basically has not told the story ever, was the story of children. So I've devoted myself to relating their story. Aware of the fact that as time marches on and they're in the grips of old age, it would be hard to locate them, I traveled around the world to gather their stories which culminated in producing a book called Heroic Children. And we tell the story of nine children, and through their voices, we tell the story of the Holocaust in a very riveting way of what they experienced. As we produced this book, it took a long, I wrote it for 14 years. And then finally, we made a very draconian deadline to complete the book. And we had made one little mistake, which was we're about to go to press, and we had neglected to make a cover to the book. Now, a cover is a very important component to a book. I always say, those who say they don't judge a book by its cover, I know they never tried to sell a book. <laughs> so we needed a cover, so I put my team on it. That means my kids. <laughs> and they went through the archives, and we came across this picture, which I think is a very dramatic picture. This picture was shot on the day that Auschwitz was liberated, meaning 75 years ago. It's a picture of many, many children. The copyright holder of the picture is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. I could not, uh, to get a cover, to a picture to use as a cover, you have to fill out an affidavit. And it said you have to sign that you're not going to make any alteration in the picture. You're not going to zoom or make this change or that change. And I wrote back in my response, I'm going to make this change and this change and that change and this change and that change. And the next day, I had permission. But they told me it would take three weeks till they can give me the picture in high resolution. Now everyone knows, ah, yeah, 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 that to turn a picture from low res to high res takes 10 seconds, not three weeks. But the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a large bureaucracy, over 300 employees. And you'll forgive me for being an Israeli, but I thought what's, what's required here is to go to the Polish Yiddish term of protexia. You need the right connections. And I have a friend who lives in Baltimore who is a very powerful individual. They say that in his cell phone, he has the private phone number of every senator and congressman. And I figured Baltimore, Washington, I was sure he had a connection in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Conveniently, his son was studying in a yeshiva in Jerusalem right next to my house. I ran to the yeshiva and I said, Arye, I'll bet your father is connected to the, and I thought this was rhetorical, I'll bet your father is connected to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And he said, no. <laughs> Disenchanted, crestfallen, melancholy, I'm walking out the door, and he tells me as I'm leaving, but my mother is on the board. <laughs> I was going to wring his neck. <laughs> his mother is a lawyer, is a judge, Chaya Friedman, I send her an email, say, Chaya, I desperately need your help. I need this picture. I tell her the lot number, the picture number, and I need it yesterday. The next day, I have the picture, I res, and that night, we're going to press. Now, I'm going to use a technical term here. This is called a press queue. I have a press queue in the largest press in Israel, arguably the largest press in the Middle East, for 10 o'clock that night. Three hours before a press queue. By the way, then I had this idea, as I told you, my methodology in teaching the Holocaust is always to highlight the individual. It's an individual story. It's not just six million souls. So what I wanted to do was to color the picture is sepia to highlight one child. But I didn't have permission. I felt I really need permission for this. So I write back Judge Friedman. I said, Judge, I need you to work, get me permission for this. And she writes me back, she's in the middle of, converting, of convening a murder trial. She has no time. I tell her, Judge, this is killing me. 
And she says, I prevail upon her, and she writes back, yay, yay, nay, nay. Because I made the request, but I cannot convince you that they'll agree. And I'm thinking to myself, come on. This is the Holocaust. It's apple pie, it's mom, it's the flag. No one's going to have a problem. Three hours before press queue, or to be accurate, two hours and 48 minutes, I get an email from the head archivist the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, Dear Rabbi Teller, we regret to inform you, you may not use the picture. If you wish to use the picture in its pristine state without making any alterations or zooming or coloring, you may. But once you make the slightest change, you do not have our permission. And particularly, you wish to highlight this boy. He recently spoke out. He's very sensitive. And our legal department said unequivocally, you may not use this picture. Ay, 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 ay. But I'm not such a pushover. And I, a little bit of a fighter, I already had the plates burned. They're on the drums. In an hour, uh, pardon me, an hour and 58 minutes, we're going to have 10,000 covers. So I write back, please, tell me his name and his phone number. I wish to speak with him. One hour and three minutes to press queue. She writes back, we don't know his name. We don't even know where he lives. I said, but, but, but you just said that he's sensitive and he spoke out. 26 minutes to press queue. She sends me an online clipping that was shot on the 70th anniversary of the, re of the liberation of Auschwitz, showing this picture with several people, obviously in the grips of old age, pointing to themselves as youngsters in the picture. It was apparent from this clipping, not clear, but apparent, that this boy's name is Hirsch. I don't know if that's his first name. I don't know if that's his last name. It could be both. And it said, if that was him, he lived in Europe. I now have 14 minutes to locate Hirsch in Europe. <laughs> so Sherlock Teller is thinking, where will I find this Hirsch in Europe? So if you look at the picture, I knew the kid couldn't be a Pole. He looks too good to be a Pole. <laughs> to look this good, you'd have to be Hungarian. Hungary was invaded March 1944. To be in this shape, he must be Hungarian. And Sherlock Teller is thinking, where would a Hungarian survivor of Auschwitz live in Europe today? I right away, right away discounted England and Russia, Eurasia, and not Israel. So now I'm left with about 28 countries with eight minutes. And then I concluded you have to be either Belgium or Switzerland. And I have a pretty close friend who lives in Zurich. His name is Moshe Luzer. And I call up Moshe. said, Moshe, I said, I need you to. Now, he works for IBM. What a match. IBM, he's in Switzerland. I said, Moshe, find me this guy, Holocaust survivor who lives in Switzerland. He said, what's his name? I said, Hirsch. He said, would that be his first name <laughs> or his last name? I said, I don't know. He said to me, is he religious? I don't know. He said, Hanoch. What have you been drinking? <laughs> I said, I'm not drinking any. I got five minutes. I got to find this guy. He said, you know what? You know what? I'm sure he's Hungarian. Try Gavor or Tibor Hirsch. That's the Hungarian equivalent of Mike or Steve. I hear him clicking. He says, Gavor Hirsch, 89-year-old engineer. Here's his phone number. I call him up with four minutes to spare. I speak to my Heuche Deutsch, and he gives me permission. I right away dash off a letter to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I tell her, the le head archivist, I have permission. And I think, and I, if you don't trust me, here's his phone number, but it's, he's an elderly gentleman. It's now 9 o'clock in Switzerland. Don't call tonight. <laughs> and this is Gaber Hirsch holding my book in Switzerland. So. <laughs> I want you to know it would have been more difficult for me to parallel park <laughs> than to get this guy in one phone call. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for allowing me to reveal to you the psyche of a post-Holocaust Jew. And thank you for being God-fearing individuals. Keep admitted to the most obvious take-home, which is that of never again. And now I call up Pastor Brogy to complete the story of anti-Semitism.
know it's surprising to many people to think that the Christian church has actually helped fuel the whole cause of anti-Semitism for the last several hundred years. Uh, the roots of replacement theology, which we've spoken about many a Sunday here at Community Bible Church, and a hatred for the Jewish people in many ways has come from the church. But of course, many things that have been done in the name of Christianity hasn't always been done by true Christians. We can't deny our roots. Here is a picture of one of the oldest artifacts ever found from the first century in Jerusalem. You can see there is a menorah and the star David right underneath it, which is probably more a geometric design than anything else. And then coming from that is an ichthus. And it symbolized that the Christian roots came from uh, Judaism. And of course, the word ichthus is a Greek word for fish. And so it becomes a symbol. Jesus Christos Theos, we also tear Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so it became a vital symbol in the Christian church. And, and yet as time progressed, our Jewish roots were denied by more and more people. And people began to think differently. Here's a picture of a gentleman by the name of Eusebius. He uh, lived from 275 to 339. He taught that the promises of Scripture were given to the Gentiles and the curses were meant for the Jews. Uh, here's another picture. Hanok mentioned him in his presentation. John Chrysostom, uh, he lived from 349 to 407. He did a whole series of sermons against the Jews. There's a quote from one. The synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging place for wild beasts. Jews are inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. As time went on, 354 A.D., Augustine is born, and he was probably the most prolific influence of, through his writings on creating a different view of how to view Jewish people. He said, and I quote, how hateful to me are the enemies of your scripture. How I wish that you would slay them, referring to the Jews, with your two-edged sword, so that there should be none to oppose your word. And so he introduced what was called the theory of substitution, that the church had become the new Israel and had taken the place of God's promises to the Jewish people. Of course, he sowed the seeds that would be uh, embraced by Roman Catholics. Here is a Pope Gregory IX in 1227. He wrote these words. He said, they ought to know the yoke of perpetual enslavement, referring to Jewish people, because of their guilt. See to it that the perfidious Jews never in the future become insolent, that they always suffer publicly the shame of their sin and servile fear. Uh, 1568, Pius V, Pope Pius V said, the Jewish people fell from the heights because of their faithlessness and condemned their Redeemer to a shameful death. The godlessness that has assumed such forms uh, for the salvation of their own people, it has become necessary now to prevent their disease. A, a somewhat convoluted statement, but basically he hated the Jews. Martin Luther comes, of course, out of Roman Catholicism. He slightly changed Augustine's theology that was adopted by the popes of his day and said, well, the church is not the Roman Catholic Church, but the church is bo the body of Christ. But nonetheless, he taught that the church had replaced Israel. And we heard snippets of a sermon. I've quoted it in length in some messages from Revelation 12. Luther, in one booklet that he wrote in 1537, said, their synagogues and schools should be burned. Their houses should be destroyed. Their Talmudic writings should be confiscated. Their rabbis should be forbidden to teach. Their money should be taken from them. And they should be compelled into forced labor. In 1924, Hitler spoke in Berlin and received a standing ovation to these words. He said, I believe that today I am acting in accordance with the will of Almighty God as I announce the most important work that Christians could undertake. And that is to be against the Jews and get rid of them once and for all. And then he proceeded to underscore that it was Martin Luther who had the profound influence in his thinking. He said in that speech, 
Martin Luther has been the greatest encouragement of my life. Luther was a great man. He was a giant. With one blow, he heralded the coming of the new dawn and the new age. He saw clearly that the Jews need to be destroyed, and we're only beginning to see what we need to do to carry on this work. In the Nuremberg trials, uh, Julius Stretcher said, I have never said anything that Martin Luther did not say. John Calvin, 1560, wrote these words. There, referring to the Jews, they are rotten and unbending stiff-neckedness, deserves that they be oppressed unendingly without measure or end, and that they die in their misery without the pity of anyone. As the centuries went on, Pope Pius XII, in 1943, wrote a letter to FDR as the smoke was ascending from the chambers across Europe, and he asked him to oppose the concept of the Jews having their own homeland. In spite of the fact that God said it is their land, in spite of the fact that God had prophesied that the Jews would return to their land, he pleaded with FDR not to allow them to have their own homeland. Uh, while he was the Cardinal Pacelli, he actually gave money to Hitler to help start the Nazi party. Uh, he has what we call a holy silence as it's often referred to, and the Vatican says, well, he actually defended the Jews, but they have never once opened up the archives and have demonstrated that that was true. Uh, Pope Paul VI, more recent for many of us, uh, he said, quote, the church is the new people of God. In 2010, uh, reaffirming what Vatican II had stated through Pope Paul VI, the cardinal of uh, College of Cardinals said, we Christians cannot speak of the promised land as an exclusive right for a privileged Jewish people. This promise was nullified by Christ. In the kingdom of God, there is no longer a chosen people. And of course, uh, it was argued by many so-called Christians throughout the centuries that the Jews were Christ killers and therefore needed to be opposed. And of course, people who have read their Bible know that that's an inaccurate and an incomplete portrayal. Certainly it is true that the religious leaders, as Matthew 26 and verse 4 indicates, schemed to arrest Jesus and secretly to kill him. But they were not alone in the process. He stood, of course, before Pontius Pilate, a Gentile, and it was Roman soldiers who literally put the nails through his hands and his feet. But the Bible would teach that not only were the Jews involved in the death of Christ and the Roman government, but everyone in this room. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. It was our hard hearts that acted as the hammers and our sins that were the nails. And not only that, not only were the Jews and the Romans and each of us involved in the crucifixion of Christ, the Bible says God the Father was involved. Isaiah 53, 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. In Acts 2, 23, as Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, it says that Jesus was, quote, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And so God is clear that the death of his son was his plan to redeem us. It was promised as early as Genesis 3, foretold and prophesied specifically, foreshadowed in so many different ways all the way through the Old Testament. And God's word affirms both Testaments, the Jewish people as God's chosen nation, and that yes, while he gave them the land, he gave them a land that was inhabited by people that were doing wicked things beyond anything we could imagine. But God also, with a covenant he made with Abraham, an unconditional covenant. Abraham, if you remember, was asleep when God made the promise to choose the Jewish nation. It had nothing to do with the Jew. It had everything to do with God Almighty, an unconditional unilateral government, covenant that God himself will keep. But in the Mosaic Covenant, God also warned that if the Jewish people would not obey, that the very land he would give them, he would drive them from. And so Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 28, it shall come about 
that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you, to multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish, to destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. And so God warned that they would experience turmoil if they rebelled against him. But while they would experience turmoil, God also promised their preservation. And so today we have a new form of anti-Semitism that expresses itself in many different ways, not just the things that we see on the news, but also what's going on in the college campuses in America that most evangelical Christians are asleep to. Even in our own state at universities like Clemson and USC, the boycott, divest movement, sanction movement is nothing short of another expression of anti-Semitism. Add to that, there was a document signed at Knox Sem Seminary, I said cemetery, might as well be a cemetery, but <laughs> seminary, by some, what we would consider godly men, and that they have the gospel, they are not in the least bit Jew haters by any stretch, but they have taught that the church has replaced Israel, that God has done with the Jewish people, and through that teaching, it's created a vacuum in our day to spread anti-Semitism. Whether it was D. James Kennedy or R.C. Sproul or over 100 signers to that document, by not teaching what God says about the Jewish people, it opens the door for anti-Semitism. But people who think that God is done with the nation of Israel have not read their Bible very carefully. Listen to these words from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for night by light, for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth stretched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. He could not have said it any more plainly, any more clearly, that as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are in the sky, God will be faithful to his people, Israel. But there has been anti-Semitism, no doubt, I think, led by the greatest anti-Semite, and his name is Satan. He's the God of this world, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and he inspires anti-Semitism, whether it was the first anti-Semite in human history, the Pharaoh of Egypt, who wanted to kill all the little baby Jewish boys after they were born much like we want to do in America today. It's beyond belief that a little crying, struggling baby can be killed if the mother and the doctor so choose. Or whether he tried to destroy them at the Red Sea during the time of the Exodus, or when the walls were being built by Nehemiah for the protection of the people, or whether King Herod wanting to kill all the little baby boys there in Bethlehem, Time after time after time, Satan has opposed the Jewish people. And why does he hate the Jewish people so much? Number one, they are his chosen people. God is enacting his plan for the ages through the Jewish people. Just as he used the Jewish people the first time to bring the Savior into the world, he will use the Jewish people to bring the Savior back again. He hates the Jewish people because the Jewish people have given us the only book that God ever wrote. 66 books of the Bible, every single one of them written by a Jewish man. And God has given us his holy scripture, and Satan hates the scripture, so he hates the Jew. He hates the Jew because God gave us the Savior of the world through the Jew. He hates the Jew because God will use the Jewish nation and the history of the church to bring more people to repentance, and to a saving knowledge of Jesus than any other people since the church began on Pentecost. Because there will come a time in human history where 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are described in Revelation 7 and two Old Testament saints, 
I have suggested to you that they are Moses and Elijah because the Bible teaches the second coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, not to mention the ministry these two men have mimicked the ministries that both Moses and Elijah had. But they will do what we've not been able to do in 2,000 years. The Great Commission will be fulfilled. This gospel shall go to the whole world, and then Jesus will come back. And when their ministry is done, John sees people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And that's why Satan hates the Jews. And he hates the Jews because this one we call Yeshua, Jesus, is coming back. And when he comes back, it's written so clearly in Scripture, Satan's end will come forever and ever and ever as he, too, is cast into the lake of fire. We are living in a day of challenge. We are living in a day of promise. Because God also said that though he would scatter the Jews to the further four corners of the earth, he would also regather them. And he says it time and time and time again that he will gather, regather them in the latter years. And God often uses the wrath of man to praise him. And so, yes, the Holocaust is just beyond imagination. And some of you have been with me through Yad Vashem, and we've heard... Hanak lecture for two hours and it's, uh, it's incredible what happened. He's just giving us a sliver tonight. It's so sad what has happened. But God uses the wrath of man to praise him. In the very horror of the Holocaust, God used to create and to accelerate a movement that really started in the late 1890s, but it was accelerated through the work of Hitler, unbeknownst to him, to gather the Jewish people back into the land. And God said that would happen at the end of time. And we are witnessing that very thing in our day. You are seeing prophecy fulfilled in this century. It is absolutely astounding. And then after the Jewish people are in the land, and the true Christians are removed. It's called the rapture. The time of Jacob's trouble will begin. Daniel said it's the worst time that human history will ever know. And Jesus quoted Daniel in Matthew 24 and stated the same truth. And God will use that time to open the eyes of the Jewish people to see that Jesus is indeed the Savior. And then he will use that nation to fill, fulfill the Great Commission like we've never, ever seen it fulfilled before. And someday, even in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, God will continue to herald the Jewish people because as we have studied in Revelation and the foundation stones on the gates are written not just the names of the 12 apostles, who are all Jewish, by the way, but also the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And God's whole plan of salvation will be marveled at for all of eternity. Now, if you're here, I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile or whatever you are, there's one thing everyone needs, and it's forgiveness. We are sinners, and our sin can express itself in so many different ways, some more heinously than others. But for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, has become guilty of all, James will write the half-brother of Jesus. It's not the amount of sin that will keep you out of heaven, it's the fact of sin. And the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel said, the soul who sins must die. But God who set the penalty loved you so much that he paid it for you in a substitute. He would be pierced through for our iniquities. And then God promised that he would raise him from the dead. He would not allow his flesh, Isaiah said, to undergo decay. And he has been declared Lord by his resurrection. And if you're not sure what that means, if you're not sure that the Bible is a reliable, trustworthy document, the only book God inspired, I would be more than happy to help anyone in this room. Because this is not a foolish faith where you put your brain on a shelf and take a blind leap. It is a faith that is built 
on a God who has demonstrated that he is trustworthy. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the sobering things that we have heard. We thank you that you are faithful to your promises, that you cannot lie. Moses wrote that you are not like a man that you would ever lie. And we thank you that you are true and faithful. And thank you for your demonstration of your faithfulness, even to the nation of Israel, through all of the hatred that has been inspired through many and the evil one himself. You have preserved them as a nation the very things that you promised centuries ago you are fulfilling before our own eyes. May we not be blind to what is taking place in our day. May we be faithful stewards of the gospel of your son and the forgiveness that he offers men and women and boys and girls. Thank you that whoever will call upon his name will be saved. We love you, our Father. We deserve nothing, but you've showered your incredible grace upon us. We are so thankful in Jesus' name.